Most people think bulking just means eating more, but that's exactly why most bulking phases fail. You end up gaining weight way too fast, stopping too early, and mistaking fat gain for muscle. In this video, I'll break down the seven biggest bulking mistakes backed by science and show you how to actually build muscle without getting fat. Our first mistake is probably the most common one, and honestly, also the worst one, and that's gaining weight way too fast. You see, most beginners, when they first start lifting weights, are told to gain weight. And when they do, they gain weight pretty fast, and they see great results, because they're beginners. They're in such a good position to put on muscle that they can gain weight at a fast pace and still have that weight mostly be muscle mass. However, the truth is that for the average intermediate and beyond lifter, you should likely slow down how fast you gain weight. The research generally supports, in my opinion, a weight gain pace of half a percent of your body weight per month to 1% of your body weight per month. If you weigh 200 pounds, that's only one to two pounds gained per month of bulking. We have four studies on bulking. Two of them are in beginners and the remaining two are in more advanced lifters. What do the two studies in more advanced lifters have in common? They both show that gaining weight too fast likely just increases fat gain with no apparent advantage for muscle growth. Whereas the studies by Rosnick and by Smith generally do show that gaining weight somewhat faster can be helpful in beginners. So as a good rule of thumb, the more advanced you are, the slower your rate of weight gain should probably be. And indeed, a slower rate of weight gain if you're more advanced oftentimes gets you longer bulks, which can be very beneficial in terms of ensuring progressive overload week upon week, month after month. That's exactly the sort of training and consistency and progressively overloading that will build muscle long term. It can also promote healthier food habits, since you're not constantly switching from trying to get into a large surplus, consuming plenty of very calorie-dense foods, then switching back to very nutrient-dense foods during a cut. By accepting a slightly slower rate of weight gain, you can often focus on overall healthier habits, like implementing a better balance of nutritious foods and more calorie-dense foods. This can also pay off long-term for your overall health. So instead of gaining weight super fast, focus on gaining weight at 0.5 to 1% per month, or maybe a bit faster if you're a complete beginner. Our second big bulking mistake is going off of singular weigh-ins. You've probably experienced this. You're trying to gain weight and you get a weigh-in that is way lower than you'd hoped for. Now, if you're the average person, you're gonna see that and freak out, thinking, oh, is my bulk really working? The truth is that a single weigh-in is impacted by a million different things including how much food weight you ate the day before, how high sodium that food was, how many carbs that food contained, whether you had a high stress day these past few days, whether you had bad sleep, whether your food had high fiber content, and many, many more things. Indeed, it's not uncommon to see fluctuations of up to two to 3% up or down from your quote unquote, true weight on a day-to-day -day basis. For example, let's say your true weight, we knew with perfect knowledge, was 200 pounds. It is really not uncommon or abnormal to observe weigh-ins ranging from 195 to 205 day to day when your true weight is 200. However, when you're trying to gain weight, seeing that variation can oftentimes cause you to freak out, make adjustments to your diet when they shouldn't be required. For example, you might notice a weigh-in that's way lower than you expected and suddenly bump up your calories by a few hundred permanently. Then that leads to you gaining more weight than you wanted and then you reduce calories again off of one weigh-in. What's the solution? Go off of seven or even 14 day averages. Instead of looking at today's weigh-in, look at the past seven weigh-ins every single day. Average those seven days. Instead of comparing today's weigh-in to yesterday's weigh-in, compare this week's average to last week's average. And in general, draw that comparison between one week's average and the previous week's average once a week. And be slow in making adjustments. The fluctuation in your weight day to day can be so great that oftentimes you're better off waiting two to three weeks before making an adjustment to your diet based on your weigh-in average rather than making an adjustment only after one week. This will prevent you overcorrecting your diet and wasting time. Our third big mistake during a bulk is not tracking and weighing yourself consistently. Now, I wanna make one thing very clear. You don't need to be tracking your calories and macros to be gaining weight successfully. Theoretically, you could just weigh yourself and look at your weigh-ins go up and adjust your overall eating patterns that way. I've made a whole video on how I did that during a cut. However, for those of you struggling to gain weight, or for those of you who are actually trying to track macros and calories to gain weight, it is hugely beneficial to track consistently, especially if you're struggling to put on weight. If you're someone who struggled to put on weight your whole life, this can be a major key. For one, the research on weight loss in particular clearly shows that self-monitoring behaviors, things like tracking your calories, weighing yourself, are associated with meeting your dietary goals, whether that be weight loss or weight gain. And in my coaching experience, people who stop tracking, especially hard gainers, will struggle to keep weight on or even gain weight in the first place. How do you know you're in a surplus if you're not tracking consistently? And this mistake gets even worse. Some people, when bulking, don't even have a scale at home. 
How are you going to know whether or not you're bulking successfully at the right pace or even gaining weight at all if you don't have a scale at home? Honestly, having a scale at home is even more important than tracking your calories in my view. Because otherwise, you're oftentimes restricted to getting weigh-ins at the gym after you've had a drink, before or after a workout with different amounts of food in you, the noise increases drastically. Meanwhile, getting a scale costs 10, 20 bucks, and then you have a scale at home, and you can just weigh yourself consistently and actually assess your rate of weight gain and whether or not your bulk is successful. So please, get a scale if you don't have one already. It is genuinely mind-boggling to me, the number of people who do not have a scale at home. Time and time again, someone will tell me, hey, I thought I was gaining weight, but it turns out I just weighed myself at the gym and I'm five pounds lighter than before. Yeah, just buy a scale. If you want to level up your training, check out MyoAdapt, the app I co-founded to help you apply the science from this channel. It builds evidence-based routines around progressive overload and smart excess selection, lets you emphasize the muscles you care about, and tracks progress automatically. Train anywhere, home or gym, in as little as 15 minutes, and switch between gyms seamlessly. Head to myoadapt.com and use code WOLF for a free two-week trial. However, if you prefer to work with me directly, you can also apply for one-on-one -on -one coaching, while I'll work with you directly to optimize your training, nutrition, and recovery. Big thanks as always to Rascal Apparel for supporting the channel. You can use code WOLF for 10% off their training gear at rascalapparel.com. Our next big mistake during a bulk is getting out of shape. Now let me clarify what I mean by that. Many people report feeling out of shape during a bulk. That feeling alone doesn't really mean much. What is more concerning to me is that many people during a bulk will let go of some healthy behaviors. Specifically, during a weight loss phase, they'll do all sorts of things to increase energy expenditure. Things like going for more walks, being generally more physically active, getting outdoors more. But then during a bulk, especially if there's someone who struggles to gain weight, they will drop all of that. And the truth is, this is a bad idea for most people because those behaviors are so health promoting. And ultimately, gaining all the weight in the world probably shouldn't be your goal if it means compromising your overall health. So try to keep your overall activity levels, your steps, your intentional exercise inside the gym, other sports, etc., pretty high. Does it need to be quite as high as during the weight loss phase? Not necessarily. But I would still aim for at least 8 to 10,000 steps per day and at least a few sessions in the gym a week. And I would try not to avoid activity just for the sake of getting into a surplus. This isn't true in every case. There are genuinely exceptions out there. People who with every single bit of dietary guidance on how to get more calories in and get into a consistent surplus, if they stay pretty physically active, will struggle to gain weight. For those people, you can ignore this mistake slightly. That doesn't mean doing endless cardio, it just means keeping up your physical activity that you usually do. And this brings me to my next big mistake, and that's generally stopping healthy habits you developed during weight loss phase. More specifically, the consumption of fruits, vegetables, and fiber in general. We have several very large scale meta-analyses clearly showing an association between fiber intake and overall health. Things like all-cause mortality, cardiovascular disease, and the same thing goes for fruits and vegetable consumption, clear relationships, between consumption of fruits and vegetables and your overall risk of all-cause mortality, cardiovascular disease, etc. And the associated risk reduction can be quite substantial, around 20 to 30%, going from no consumption to substantial consumption. As cliche as it sounds, eating your fruits and vegetables will make you a substantially healthier person. And so as much as I want to say, hey, whatever it takes, goddammit, eat whatever you want, seafood diet, cookies, this doesn't count, this is just a healthy snack, it does matter get your fruits and vegetables in, even in a surplus. There is some nuance here. If you're struggling to gain weight, despite including some processed foods to get more calories in, despite genuinely following good dietary guidance, you can reduce your fruits and vegetable consumption slightly, especially compared to when you're in deficit, where you might be doing this even more so. But in general, I really want lifters to hit at least five servings of fruits and vegetables per day in a bulk, and ideally, at least 10. I personally aim for 10, even in a surplus, and it helps you gain weight at a more moderate pace. Which goes back to our first mistake, getting weight too fast. And consuming these 5 to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables per day then feeds into not gaining weight too fast because you'll feel more satiated. And as a result, you won't be inclined to get into as large of a calorie surplus. So not only is it health promoting for many lifters, it makes it easier to get into the right surplus as opposed to an excessive one. Our next mistake is overinterpreting the initial weight gain. I can't tell you how many times I've coached a client who's gone from a weight loss phase into a bulk and is quickly freaking out over how much weight they gained. Let's say you ended your cut at 180 pounds. That was your lowest weigh in during your weight loss phase. You might expect your weight gain journey, your bulk phase, to go quite smoothly after that, going from 180 to say 181 in the first month, then 182 in the second month, 183 in the third month, linearly up one pound per month. 
but that is not at all what happened, because when you switch from a cutting phase to a bulking phase, you're oftentimes increasing your daily calories by 500, maybe 1,000 even. And when you increase your calories, several things happen that will inflate your weight very quickly. One, generally, your total food weight will increase. Since you're consuming more calories, that generally means more food, which generally means more food weight, which generally means more food weight in your gastrointestinal tract when you actually go to weigh yourself. Additionally, more calories usually means more carbohydrates, which means replenishing glycogen, glycogen binds to water, which means, again, slightly increased scale weight. Third, sodium. When you increase your calories, especially reintegrating some more processed foods that are higher in salt, that can also increase your weight. All of those things mean that in our example of adding your cut at 180, you might go up by 2 to 3 percent, up to say 184, 186 even. But if you're actually tracking your calories, which you should be in most cases, then there's no chance that four to six pounds of weight gain is actual fat mass. Because many lifters see this two to three percent, freak out, and oftentimes yo-yo diet, where then they start cutting again to get that four to six pounds off. And then they get those four to six pounds off, get back into a bulk, and gain four to six pounds back, and repeat the process. And that's not something you want to do. So don't freak out over the first two to three percent of weight gain switching from a cut to a bulk, especially if you're in a relatively big deficit. And this yo-yo dieting approach goes into our next mistake, which is stopping the bulk early because you feel fat on a given day. There's a few things to worry about here. The first one is that everyone feels fat at some point. How you feel on any given day in your journey should not determine your long-term course of action. Just like we don't look to individual weigh-ins to guide our journey, we look at averages, you should look at it the same way. And it's natural to gain some fat in your bulking journey. So I'd encourage you not to take the feeling of feeling fat on a given day as meaning you need to stop your bulk now. Additionally, if you're feeling fat out of a health concern, let me give you some context from the research. But let's say you're not feeling fat for aesthetic reasons, but rather you're feeling fat because you're worried about your health. And body fat for health is our next big mistake. Because the fitness industry seems to have people thinking that a super low body fat is healthy. But the research disagrees. The biggest meta-analysis on body fat percentage and overall health comes from Jayeti and colleagues. In their meta-analysis, they looked at the relationship between body fat percentage in both men and women and overall health, or risk of all-cause mortality. Get this. For men, the body fat percentage that was associated with the best health outcomes was around 22%. And for women, it was closer to around 32%. Here's what that means for you. If you're not substantially over, say, 25% body fat for men or 35% body fat for women, chances are your body fat percentage alone isn't really causing you to have worse health and you don't need to start cutting because you're 20% body fat or 18% body fat, as many people seem to think. And in fact, many of the people you see online and you think, oh, they're lean, they're in good health, are actually probably in slightly worse health on account of their body fat percentage. And honestly, if I didn't make a living off YouTube, I would probably be closer to 20% body fat day to day. So you can absolutely stop your bulk because you've reached a higher body fat percentage than you deem as aesthetic. Or maybe you just don't feel great at a higher body fat percentage. But when it comes to health, don't worry too much if you're below say 25% as a man. Those were all the bulking mistakes. I hope you liked the video. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.